What up, y'all? It's the Dirty D from SVMTG. We like to have magic stuff. And today we got more Dominaria United spoilers. That's how preview season works. It's just day two. And honestly, a lot of the stuff from today was draft and sealed stuff. So we're going to do things a little bit differently than we normally do them, right? Usually I start with the draft and sealed stuff. We kind of ratchet up the tension until we get to the best cards of the day. But instead today, I'm actually going to go over the rares and mythics and standard playables and stuff first in ascending order, and then we'll close things out with all the draft stuff. I didn't want the video to be front loaded with 20 minutes of like drafty mess so we'll talk about limited at the end and we'll go through all the really good stuff first now just because we're going to start the day on rares and mythics doesn't mean that we're going to kick things off with a standard playable card let's look at rage fire hellkite here first this is six mana four and two red for a five three dragon with flying and whenever it attacks you may sacrifice another creature if you do rage fire hellkite gains double strike until end of turn so Lightning Strike got reprinted. I don't really like how that affects this card's chances, but it's still a cool card, especially alongside stuff like Reckless Storm Seeker, like anything that can give it haze. If it's really good with the Storm Seeker, just swing for 12. You know, it seems, seems okay. So I wouldn't completely cut it out of contention depending on its synergy with other cards, but even with the Storm Seeker trick, it's like six mana. Like Six mana is so much and three toughness is so little. Here comes another six mana card that probably won't see too much standard play, barring any ridiculous synergies, just like the last card, but I do think this one is marginally better and the art is really, really cool. So let's look at Cosmic Epiphany next. This is six mana, four and two blue for a sorcery. Draw cards equal to the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard. So in a deck with nothing but instants and sorceries, more or less, this could be really good, right? If X equals five, then it's kind of fine, and obviously if X equals like 10, then it's really good. You know, that might be where this card shines most. Some kind of combo deck that plays more or less nothing but instants and sorceries, but even then, this is a sorcery. It costs six mana to cast. Six mana looks so much to cast, but, you know, I imagine if you get it stuck under an arcane bombardment or something, it's probably really, really good, but is it good enough? <laughs> I kind of don't think so. But don't look now, it's a chicken, and it's also another six mana unplayable we just cycle of these today or something but anyway this one looks a little bit better at least in commander it could be pretty good here comes chaotic transformation right here six mana but it's a little easier to cast five and a red for this one and it's a sorcery exile up to one target artifact up to one target creature, up to one target enchantment, and up to one target planeswalker, and or up to one target land. For each permanent exiled this way, its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until they reveal a card that shares a card type with it, puts that card on the battlefield, and then shuffles. So it's a huge chaos warp. It's just a big old chaos warp. For double the amount of mana the chaos warp costs. But still, uh, six mana is so much, even in Commander. I know that some people in the comments section are going to look at that last card that draws all the cards and be like, well, in Commander, and like, yeah, maybe, but six mana is still kind of a lot <laughs> in almost, in basically any format. So I'm not sure how much play it sees, but it does feel like of all of the cards we've seen so far, there goes my light. There goes my light. This is why you don't have cats in the room <laughs> when you're recording YouTube videos. All right, I think it was actually miraculously able to fix the light. A rare W, but... I'm not sure what I was talking about a second ago. I think it was Chaotic Transformation. Card's kind of bad. I should have just left it at that. But let's move on to another six mana card. A lot of these today, but I actually think this is one of the better ones that we have seen today. An actual, maybe potentially good one. Here's Tyrannical Pit Lord here. First of all, I'm a sucker for a Lord of the Pit callback, so there's that. But again, I, I don't think that's like tainting... <laughs> My evaluation of the card, it looks okay. Six mana, four and two black for a six six demon with flample. And as Tyrannical Pit Lord enters the battlefield, you choose another creature you control. The chosen creature gets plus three plus three and has flying. When Tyrannical Pit Lord leaves the battlefield, sacrifice the chosen creature. Okay, so this is actually a sort of decent pile of stats for the mana cost, two relevant keyword abilities. It doesn't tie to a lightning strike, and it does something when it enters the battlefield. So I think we might have a winner. When it comes to the best of these cards today, I'm not sure this sees too much standard play, but I do like that it lets even like a 1-1 one, one fly over for 4, the turn at ETB. So if you have like a 4-4 four, four in play already, it lets that guy fly over for 7, which is a definitely not insignificant amount of damage. I don't mind this guy. But wait, there's also the green one. This is Briar Hydra right here, which is... 
actually really cool in terms of concept. It's a plant hydra, and it's actually not the first time we've seen a plant hydra, but still. This is six mana, five and a green for a six, six trample. And it has domain. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, put X plus one plus one counters on target creature you control, where X is the number of basic land types among lands you control. Now, some of the reasons that I like this, like at all, I think it's kind of worth talking about, are that it's marginally easier to cast than some of these other six drops we've seen, and it's in a color that ramps better than all the other colors. So that's worth looking at, but I like that it has Trample, and it can put the counters on itself. So Trample makes it a little bit more likely to deal some combat damage, and it's already pretty big, so it should trample over and be able to put counters on itself and just get bigger every turn and become this thing your opponent has to deal with. But you can even put counters on other stuff. It doesn't have to put counters on itself, and I kind of like that about it. But even if all it's doing is putting counters on itself, it's a must-kill thing, but your six-mana creatures should be must-kill things, and I'm pretty sure there's just way better six-mana stuff you could be doing in standard. I mean, Vorinclex rotates, but compare this to Vorinclex. I think Vorinclex is better, and that really didn't see as much play as I think a lot of us would have liked for it to have seen. But either way, I'm not sure this card is good, but it's at least, I don't know, fun to speculate on. But end of the day, I'm not sure any of these six drops see real standard play, but they're all at least pretty cool. Now you may have noticed, because you're very intelligent and you recognize patterns, that I didn't point out a white six drop. It's because white didn't get one today, but they did get a five drop that kind of feels a bit like these six drops in terms of like power level and oh, this looks like a corset card and that kind of stuff. Let's look at Sarah Redeemer next. This is five mana, three and two white for a two four angel soldier with flying. And whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, you put two plus one plus one counters on that creature. All right, so one cool thing is that it kind of prioritizes playing four ofs because it works with other copies of itself. You already have one on the table, you play another one, the one you just played, Something a 4-4 four, four flyer. Yes, we all know it would be a 4-6 flyer, not a 4-4 four, four flyer. Leave me alone. You a makeshift Sarah Angel with no vigilance, so which is actually impactful in a wandering emperor environment, but still. I don't think a five mana two four flyer is gonna see too much play. <laughs> it's standard. I don't think that's a radical statement or anything, even one that does put a good amount of power on the battlefield. Like in your Naya deck. You play Halana and Elena, and you can put two plus one plus one counters on Halana and Elena. And Halana and Elena puts two plus one plus one counters on this. And, like, all that seems really neat, but five mana. <laughs> you spend in five mana, I think you'd just be doing better things, I think. But, of course, this does work pretty well with, like, wedding announcement. <laughs> Getting, like, three threes instead of one ones is pretty good. And pretty much anything that makes small tokens, this is very good with. It doesn't only trigger once each turn, which is great. So, like, any effect that makes a buttload of small tokens all at once is probably at least decent with this. So there's good stuff you could be doing with it, but a lot of it's a little bit niche and narrow and probably more suited for the commander table. Like, no shade. It's just that the amount of time and synergy that this requires to get on the table and, you know, really get some, like, oomph out of is probably more of a commander thing than a standard thing where this hits the table for five mana and dies to a two mana removal spell and you just feel bad and you don't get any value so i'm not sure if it's destined for standard but there are cool things that can be done with it but now we get to talk about some cards that are at least like kind of better <laughs> than the cards we've already talked about today like i said man i really feel like all the cards that we've seen so far today have a core set stank to them that I'm not sure that I really like, but we're going to get into some much better stuff like the Golden Argosy. The, some of that Golden Argosy here. This is four mana for a 3-6 legendary artifact. It's a vehicle. And whenever it attacks, exile each creature that crewed it this turn and then return them to the battlefield tapped under their owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. And this crews for just one. So I guess Teleportation Circle is not leaving standard. <laughs> in a way, and now any deck can play Teleportation Circle, which is really exciting in a lot of ways. It can't flicker artifacts. or It's not strictly a Teleportation Circle commenter, person in the comment section. But I think that it's an apt comparison. Four mana for a thing that blinks a creature every turn, more or less pretty good and it has a huge toughness so it should be able to attack and survive most combat steps right again not quite as stable as a teleportation circle it can die relatively easily it doesn't guarantee you flicker a creature every turn yes there are issues <laughs> 
totally understand. But you trade all of that functionality for a card that can be played in any deck, which I think is really, really sweet. You know, you want to flicker a creature, you got a chance at it, and I think that's nice. It crews for just one. Four mana's a bit much to get on the table, but it still crews for just the one. So I kind of really like this card. It also doesn't flicker a permanent the turn it enters the battlefield unless you can give it haste. Which is actually kind of a massive downside. But again, again, six toughness is an awful lot to have to deal with. It's not the worst attacker in the world. And all you really want is that sweet flicker. And if you just hit one or two of those, as Teleportation Circle has taught us, one or two is all it takes when you're flickering, you know, Titan of Industry. So I actually really like this, and that's probably just stream dev talking you know it's a sort of mix of timmy and johnny that rests within the the depths of my soul <laughs> in, in my heart i am not a spike in my heart i like cards like this so even though i'm not sure this sees all the standard play in the world it's probably a card you're going to see on the streams a lot so get used to that but up next i gotta say i kind of feel weird talking about this card this early quote unquote in the video but we've still got a few rares after this to talk about we gotta talk about Threats Undetected next. This is three mana, two and a green for a sorcery. Search a library for up to four creature cards with different powers and reveal them. An opponent chooses two of those cards. Shuffle the chosen cards into your library, put the rest into your hand. All right, it's a gift sun given. That's what it's, if she's even doing like the same, she's laying the same way. I get what you're trying to do, wizards, but you, you made it bad. <laughs> you, just, you purposefully neutered like all of the good stuff from gifts ungiven, right? Instead of the card being instant speed, the card is sorcery speed. Terrible. It's really bad. It only hits creatures instead of anything, which is also, I like being able to tutor anything. It's like part of the whole point. But really part of the whole point with gifts ungiven is that you're able, you're able to dump the unwanted or unchosen by your opponent cards into your graveyard. Just get those back and just reanimate them or whatever you want to do. So they really, um, I guess fixed is the word here. And fixed usually means made the card fair. But here, fixed means like you would your dog. <laughs> they, they neutered this card. And I'm because of those things, I'm not sure that it's much better. Now, it is a mana cheaper than Gifts Ungiven. And it's still green card advantage. You still get to get two creatures for three mana. And you get to, you get to choose them. Now, another thing, by the way, another way they powered this down is that it's four creatures with different powers, which is strictly worse, objectively worse than four creatures with different names. You know, you might be able to go get two differently named creatures, but they have the same power, and that's just, oh, it's so annoying. <laughs> so, like, I'm just not, like, super sure this is going to see all the play in the world, but, but, you know, just this is boomer griping about a card that I'm old enough to know exists <laughs> <laughs> that might be really like coloring my perception of a pretty decent magic card that still three mana draw two of the best creatures in your deck. And that's actually kind of good. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this card shows up as like a one or two of here and there in like very specific mid-range decks or even combo decks. But problem with it being a combo deck your opponent just doesn't let you have the two things you need for your combo right but still i think that this does have some potential so don't just want to sound like i'm just crapping just <laughs> all over the card i actually think it's okay but i also have to be an old man and be like this doesn't give some given yeah it's not supposed to be gifts on given it's a really good card so <laughs> i totally get why it's not and i could see it being okay but next, let's look at Shauna, the Purifying Blade here. This is three mana. Green, a white, and a blue for a 3-3 three, three legendary human warrior with lifelink. And at the beginning of your end step, you may pay X. If you do, you draw X cards, but here's the catch. X can't be greater than the amount of life you've gained this turn. I think this is really cool. I really do. I, I have to say this about a lot of cards today. I'm not sure this sees all the standard play in the world. But it might not be for standard. It's kind of a commandery card, right? I think this is a really cool card for like an aggressive life gain strategy. And obviously, Wizards has been adding kind of aggressive life gainy cards to standard and obviously historic explorer, or whatever. For the last like three or four years now, we've gotten this new attitude for life gain where they actually like want to attack you. So this could be actually like pretty okay, you know? I mean, even in standard, if you play it on four or five mana, then it's possible that you attack with a different lifelink creature or you play a life gain spell or something like that. Or maybe you leave a mana open for Tamiya's safekeeping that turn, your opponent tries to blow it out, and you gain two life. So, you know, you can pay life or you can pay one mana at the end of your turn. Or again, if you have, <laughs> I guess you, you can't do that if you played it on curve. 
<laughs> right? But if you have enough mana, you could do that. You could protect it with the Tamiya Safekeeping and draw a card or two. At the end of your turn, that's not, like, terrible. So I kind of don't hate this. Again, I'm not sure how standard playable it really is. And I've noted on a couple of cards in this set that rather than draw you a card or do something cool when they enter the battlefield, they have to make it till the end of the turn. The new Sulkanar does that. You can draw a card off of it. During your end step, the turner comes into play, but only during your end step. It's not an ETB trigger. This does the same thing, and it makes me think that Wizards is trending more towards, well, the creature survives. You can do a thing <laughs> until the end of the turn, but not ETB. And as much as I like my ETB triggers, I also kind of respect that downgrade in power for standard. But all things considered, I think this could be cool in certain situations in, in standard, yeah. And it's actually a cool signpost for the life gain decks that do lose a couple of important cards. At least they get some card advantage now, maybe. <laughs> you know, it's not guaranteed, but maybe. So I like this, but at the end of the day, I think it's more of a commander playable, like a general, we used to call them back. Another boomer term, but still, I think it's another cool commander playable that is either in the 99 or just as your commander, a nice little dude. Or a nice little lady, I guess. Well, ladies can be dudes. That's totally whatever. I call, I call my wife dude all the time. But anyway, we'll move on to another green creature. It seems like these last few cards have been nothing but green creatures. But this one actually looks really good to me the more I think about it. When I first read it, I was like, nah, I don't know about you. But I actually, again, the more I think about it, I think this could really be standard playable. Let's take a look here at Defiler of Vigor. This looks awesome, guys. This is five mana, three and two green for a six, six Phyrexian Worm with Trample. And as an additional cost to cast green permanent spells, you may pay two life. Those spells cost green less to cast if you paid the life this way. This effect reduces only the amount of green mana you pay. And whenever you cast a green permanent spell, you put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Now, you're right, sharp-eyed internet commenters. It does kind of look like a scaled worm, which is really sweet. A little reference there. We were just talking about scaled worm on the stream the other night and freaking out about how much we love that card. And even though it's just a vanilla 7 6 or whatever. <laughs> we used, we, boomers are weird. We used to like cards. Just, oh, that card has really cool art. That's iconic for the rest of my life. I'll remember this card because it has cool art. <laughs> it's kind of, that's how we were. Um, <laughs> and Scaled Worm is kind of one of those cards. So I do appreciate the callback if that's what it's supposed to be. I think one of the horns is going the wrong way. If it's, it could be a Scaled Worm. Either way, what's the card do, Dev? I think this is cool. It looks like we might be getting a cycle of these. We saw the blue one yesterday. And just like I said with the blue one, you can, you know, play the blue one on five, the next turn play a land, and then just kind of curve into a Jenga Taxius, because it kind of ramps for you if you got the life to pay. This one, you can also curve into a seven drop in the next turn, but the seven drop is Titan of Industry, the best seven drop in the entire format. And on the way, you get a six six for five mana. <laughs> it's kind of good. Oh, and it tramples too. Uh, the card wouldn't be nearly as good without trample, but that keyword ability really perks it up. But when you do play your Titan of Industry, suddenly it gets counters too. Everything gets counters, which is just nuts. But it doesn't have to cast a Titan on the next turn, right? You can pay five for this on turn four, probably. You're going to ramp into... That's another reason I like this more than the blue one, is you're going to ramp into this one, very likely. So you get this on like turn four most of the time, and then you untap on five. And you can play like three guys if you have them in your hand, right? And your dudes will just all get huge all at one time, right? Like, the ability to put counters on each creature makes this, like, a serious must-kill for opponents. And even though, just like most five-drop creatures, this can die to a two-mana removal spell, you don't feel great, and maybe it doesn't get any value for you, the risk-reward on this is huge. You untap with this in play and a couple of dudes in your hand, and suddenly... Probably gonna win. Probably gonna win. probably gonna win the game. You know, he becomes an eight eight trample that same turn, so he's just gonna win by himself. But if you have even a small team of dudes, they just get enormous. So, really, actually like this guy a lot, and I think that he's better than I think a lot of spikes are gonna think he is. But there's yet another green rare to to finish off the rares for the day. But this one I think is definitely better than Defiler even because this one has a lot of utility to it. And I just don't see how it isn't standard playable. It competes with a card or two as well, but I still think it's going to end up winning the fight a good bit of the time. Let's look at Lana War Green Widow next. This is three mana, two and a green for a 4-3 spider. 
with reach and trample, but it also has domain, seven and a green. Return Green Widow from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. It gains, if this permanent would leave the battlefield, exile it instead. This ability costs one less to activate for each basic land type you got. Just solid. You know, I've said this a bunch of times. I'm kind of boring. I like solid things. Just solid cards. And this is a decent stat line. Four, three mana, four, three. We've seen this on Briar Bridge Tracker, which is the card that this competes with the most. But I actually think that Reach is slightly better than we tend to give it credit for. A lot of the time, you know, blocking four toughness flyers, this would have been great against like a goldfan dragon. <laughs> that would have been nice, but there's still other four toughness flyers that this can block and trade with or whatever. So I like that. It it blocks and kills that five mana Sarah thing that we looked at earlier. So hey, look at, look at that. But still, aside from just the stat line, which is, I think, really relevant, the fact that it has two keyword abilities is relevant. Trample is relevant, especially in a Planeswalker heavy format, which I would predict we're moving into, right? So Trample gets even more important, but it's also resilient. It only comes back the one time, but... Even in a mono green deck, you know, I know it costs like seven mana to activate its ability in a mono green deck. But again, in the right mid-range decks that make it till turn 100, you know, eventually you'll be able to do this and reanimate it at the end of your opponent's turn and just immediately untap it because it's not a sorcery speed ability. I think it's actually really relevant too. Now we've made it to the drafty stuff, but don't click away just yet because there's a few commons and uncommons that I'm going to kind of lead off with here that I think are going to be really important in a lot of these. You know, at least two or three of these, probably have a higher chance at seeing standard play than 80% of the cards we've covered so far today, so stick around. Most notably on this list, there's Cut Down. This is just a black mana for an instant. Destroy target creature with total power and toughness, five or less. This is actually hot, and we've talked a little bit online already about whether or not this card is, like, legacy playable, but, you know, there's bolts and fatal push and stuff like that, so I'm not too sure how legacy playable this card might be, but in standard, it does some pretty cool stuff. And obviously, Historic Explorer, anything kind of standard adjacent that's <laughs> between standard and modern, I think this could do some pretty good work, right? In standard, this kills Rafine. It costs an extra mana, but you know, whatever. It kills, it kills Rafine the moment that you see it for just two mana, which is super relevant. Anything else in the 1-4 stat line, which is slightly more common than you'd think. I mean, Skullport Merchant leaves the format, but I would imagine there's still playable 1-4s aside from Rafine. But aside from that, obviously, it kills 3-2s, 2-3s, 2-2s, 1-1s. Like, all that's good. Those are all common stat lines. And since this is an instant, it's going to kill creatures before they can grow. Like, say, a Luminarch Aspirant in Historic. This will just immediately kill for one mana, which is pretty good. You know, at, like, instant speed, that's better than, say, a Blood Chief's Thirst. But... In standard, I'm not sure, especially in best of one standard, this probably isn't going to do some of the things that Blood Chief's Thirst did for you that made it such a great removal spot. I love Blood Chief's Thirst. I'm going to miss that card a lot. But, you know, this can't come off the top of your library late in the game and kill a Planeswalker. Matter of fact, it's going to come off the top of your library late game and probably not do much. So it feels bad, you know. This is probably, more than anything, a sideboard card for control decks that... You know, oh, I lost the first game against Dagger. I'm going to be on the play this game, you know. But even when you're on the draw, this is a nice piece of removal to put in because it's just the one mana. In early game, you're going to need that against, you know, Boros aggro. Although I'm not sure Boros is really going to be a thing these first couple of months of the season until they get Battlefield Forge, the red-white pain land, which doesn't look like it's going to be in this set. But still, nonetheless, there are plenty of small aggro dudes this can kill in standard really, really early, but there's also plenty of dudes that can, you know? Like, it's going to feel bad when the Kumano faces Kakazan on turn one, and then turn two they play that 3-3 Bloodthirsty Adversary that this can't kill. Like, there are some annoying, like, lines in standard with this card in your hand, but there's, I think, going to be more often than not enough use cases for this card in the early game that it's worth running a one or two of in best of one and the same number in your sideboard in best of three. But there's a number of black cards that I really, really like today in the uncommon slot specifically, like Balduvian Atrocity. This is cute. It's probably just limited playable, but I do think it's pretty cool. This is three mana, two and a black for a toothy Phyrexian Berserker with Kicker Red. It has Menace, and when it ETBs, if it was kicked, return target creature with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste, sack it at the beginning of the next end step. This could actually be, like, kind of cuckoo bananas, man. Like, I kind of like this more than I should. Like I said, it could just be uh, limited playable. But 
Something sneaky about it, right? Like for four mana, you get a two, three menace. So that's like a body on the table that can get in some of the time. It's The body is not worth nothing. But the cool thing about it is that you get to just cast Unearth. <laughs> you get, you get, well, unearth, a, you know, sack is, sacks the guy, EOT, but still. You know, you get an Unearth that gets a three drop back, and that could be anything. It could even be a boat, but it's, you know, it could be like the three drop, three, two lifelink that gets something back. Um, you know, I can't, I can't believe, I can't remember the name of this card right now, but it's on screen right now. You'll see it. There it is right there. The three mana, three, two lifelink that brings something else back from the graveyard that can't attack until it dies. You know, you attack for three lifelink, haste, and then it dies either in combat or EOT, and now you can attack with the other two drop that you brought back. I can see some really sweet lines. With this card right here, you know, just super resilient. Being able to go all the way up to three drop is better than you think, you know. Just get back like a graveyard trespasser, swing, eat something from the graveyard, you know. It's, all of this is actually just better value than you think. It might be a little bit priced out, but I can't help but like it. But there's also Urborg Repossession. This is just a black mana for a sorcery with kicker, one and a green. Return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. You gain two life. If the spell was kicked, return another target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. Now note the subtle switch in syntax here. If you kick it, you get a creature and a permanent card from your graveyard. I think it's really, really sweet. On the one hand, it's a strictly better raise dead. <laughs> I never really played much raise dead back in the day. It's still a you know, fine card. Standard unplayable at this point, but, you know, Raise Dead plus two life is kind of okay, especially in specifically the life gain decks. That was a loud noise. I hope my house is okay, but I have a job to do. Uh, my house could be on fire. <laughs> Which is, oh, let's talk about some magic cards. I'm, that is who I am. But anyway, the card looks actually pretty good to me. I mean, for three total mana, you get card advantage. You know, three mana, card advantage in Golgari. You get to gain a little bit of life, which doesn't completely negate, like, tapping out or tapping this much mana at sorcery speed, but it helps a little bit, you know. And getting another, you know, any permanent that you, a planeswalker back from your graveyard all seems kind of gravy to me. I'm not sure that it quite meets the verification standards for power, <laughs> you know. Like, at the door, at the gate, we check power level, and a bouncer's like, ah, you're a little too low, buddy, maybe uh, try again next year. And I think this card might hit that wall, but it's very close in my mind. Here's another one like that, Scout the Wilderness. This is three mana, two and a green for a sorcery with kicker, one and a white. Search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. If the spell was kicked, Create two one one white soldier creature tokens. Okay, so it's just this ramp spell. You know, they make a variation on this ramp spell every single year. Three mana, go get a land. Maybe do something else, but in this case, it's three mana to go get a land, and then five mana to make two one ones, which I actually think you'll do more than you think. <laughs> you know, for five mana, it sounds like a lot to get one land, but you're not getting one land. You're getting a land, and you're also getting two blockers. One of the things that kind of sucks about casting a spell like this on turn three or turn five is that you're tapping a fair amount of mana. And you're not doing anything else. You know, it's not a do nothing, but it feels that way. When you got attacked on turn two, you tap all of your mana on turn three to get a land, and you get attacked again on turn three, right? So that's not good, or turn four, depending on if you're on the player or the draw. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't feel good to cast a cultivate type spell, but, you know, on turn five, if you have the mana for it, maybe you ramped on turn two, you ramp on turn three, right? You're trying to get to that seven mana Titan of Industry threshold for whatever you want, you know? <laughs> but in this case, if you want to play this on turn five, if you have nothing else to do on turn five, you might as well ramp, you might as well ramp, and you might as well get two blockers. Those two blockers are going to be very important a lot of the time, I think. There's also Talarian Geyser. This is three mana, two and a blue for a sorcery. Note that that card type, because I think it kind of kills this card, to be honest, but it's still cool. It has Kicker White. Return target creature to its owner's hand and draw a card. If the spell was kicked, you gain three life. If it were an instant, it'd be just like really annoying and probably standard playable, to be honest. I mean, even if you're just paying three mana for it, bounce a guy and draw a card at instant speed would be very good. But at sorcery speed, it's kind of terrible. <laughs> you know, Kicking it is fine. Kicking it is fine. I have a feeling this card was an instant in playtesting. And it wasn't too powerful. It was probably just too irritating. <laughs> it probably really was. You know, against aggro decks, 
on the play especially paying four mana for this would be okay you know remove that thundering rider or whatever else is trying to do a thing this turn take that tempo away i get to draw a card and gain three in the gate like last turn's entire attack that's probably pretty like good enough for a control deck at sorcery speed this just probably isn't very good at all but i still think it's a noteworthy card because of all of the things that it does. We saw Samite Herbalist and Yavimaya Steel Crusher today. One of these is better than the other, but I still like Samite Herbalist a bit. This is two mana, one and a white for a 2-1 human cleric, and whenever it becomes tapped, you gain life. Just one. <laughs> you just gain life. <laughs> you gain one life and you scry one. Not terrible. You don't really want to attack too much with this because it's got the one toughness, but when it does attack, at least it gives you some bonus. I'm not sure that it makes it into the standard life gain decks or anything because it's not too reliable, but in limited, curve filler, the scry is going to be fine. It's whatever. It's a, For limited, this is probably one of those bread and butter playable two-drop creatures, so just remember it exists. As far as Yavimaya Steel Crusher, though, I like this a little bit more. This is two mana, one and a red for a 2-2 with Enlist. A little reminder here. When the creature attacks, you can tap a dude that's not summoning sick, and you add that dude's power to this guy's power. You can also pay one and sacrifice Steel Crusher to destroy an artifact. This is actually, like, somewhat standard playable looking. You know, I mean, we get creatures like this every now and again in both green and red. And again, it's marginal and narrow, but they are somewhat playable, especially in best of three sideboards. So I wouldn't be surprised to see this in like a red aggro deck that has to kill artifacts. And that ability is going to get way more important once we go to Brothers War and then back to Phyrexia after that, you know, to like... Pretty or mirrored in yeah, it's Phyrexia. <laughs> Still, after we we're gonna get some or some artifact sets, you know, after this this set comes out. So this is only gonna get even better. And all of these, all of these like two mana creatures that can blow up artifacts, always somewhat playable. But this one even more so in some ways because it can attack for like five if it has to <laughs> some of the time, you know. So I don't hate this. I really don't. But for the real butter and the real bread for limited, we've got things like Frostfist, Strider, and Mesa Cavalier, right? Cavalier's just Windrake, you know, three mana, two and a white for a two, one human knight with flying. And when it ETBs, you gain two life. Well, it's not bad. It's just not terrible, I guess. I'd much rather have like Angelic Overseer, but we saw how much that kind of didn't break, but really strained <laughs> the limited environment for Nuka Pena. One of the best commons in that set was Overseer. And this is nowhere close to Overseer, but I still want to compare it for some reason. You know, <laughs> Two life is nowhere near. It doesn't. An extra life does not make up for a card <laughs> any day of the week, but it's still probably going to be a play limited card because it's a three mana, two power flyer. But Frostfist Strider is the answer to the, the question, you know, how do we make Frost Titan an uncommon? This is how you do it right here. It's five mana, three and two blue for a four, four elemental giant with ward two. And when it ETBs, you tap a creature and opponent controls and put a stun counter on it, which locks the creature down for a turn, basically. This is actually not terrible. <laughs> this is like more than playable and limited, but uh, very probably not playable in standard. And the only reason I say that is because I see people asking if this is playable in standard. The answer is very likely no. Now we got the Sarah reference today, so we got to get a Singer reference too. His Singer Connoisseur here is five mana, three and two black for a three three vamp with flying. And whenever one or more other creatures die, you put a plus one plus one counter on Connoisseur. This ability triggers only once each turn for some reason. <laughs> Hey, here's a callback to one of your favorite old cards, Boomers. Isn't that fun? Like, yeah, if it were actually fun. It would be a lot more fun, but it only triggers once a turn. What are you doing? Like, I know you just sack a bunch of guys and suddenly you're like an eight power flyer, but that would be fun. I don't, I don't see the problem here. Where's the, where's the issue? I just think this card could have been like really cool and very. I keep, I, I, I don't know, I don't want to make these calls because I'm probably just wrong. But this strikes me as the kind of card that did exactly that during development and was a rare. <laughs> they brought it down to uncommon and once a turn. Eh. But still, in limited, this is probably really good. You know, 5 mana 3-3 three, three flyers, not a great stat line in that environment. But it can and almost certainly will grow to like a 5-6-7 power dude if your opponent doesn't neutralize it. So I actually really like this, and especially if a format like Sealed. Let's take a look at Voda C Scavenger here. 3 mana, 2 and a blue for a 3-2 Merfolk Rogue with Domain. And you get to look at the top X cards of your library when it ETBs. And X is obviously the number of basic lands you control. Basic land types. <laughs> Let me be very clear. You may put one of those cards on top of your library, put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So they screwed this up. If this was uh, put it in your hand, the card might actually be playable. 
but obviously they've uh, powered down these last couple of cards we've looked at to where they wouldn't be quite as standard playable, but this might still be limited playable to help find your bomb. We got Volsh Tide Turner, Vyashino Branch Rider, and Snare Spinner, which is a reprint, but still, again, limited playable card here. It's a 2-mana 1-3 reach. It's a spider. Whenever it blocks a dude with flying, it gets plus 2, plus 0 till end of turn. So, it tends to block Windrakes. We just talked about 3-mana you know, 2 Power Flyers. It tends to be very good at blocking those. And those are very important creatures and limited, so don't, you know, don't devalue a good old snare spinner in your green deck. It can be pretty decent a lot of the time, but Vyashino Branch Rider is just a red mana for a 1-1 Vashino Warrior with kicker 2 and a green. It has haste as well. If Vashino Branch Rider was kicked, if it, it, it enters the battlefield, what's wrong with me? It enters the battlefield with 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. It has 2 and a red, pump it for 2 plus 0 till end of turn. Um, that is not terrible. Again, mostly in limited, but even in standard. This is a Raging Goblin. <laughs> you know, it's a one mana, one one ace. It can be a little bit bigger if you need it to be bigger. It's still like a four mana, three three haste, which I know sounds really bad and unplayable, but on certain boards, like against control and stuff like that, like after a sweeper, or you need to ambush that planeswalker or whatever, like it could be like somewhat okay. And then you can also just pump it. Which again, like, okay, a Raging Goblin that is also a Mana Sink later in the game. Like, here's the thing, guys. I'm actually talking myself into this card. <laughs> like, even in non-green decks. Like, oh, Raging Goblin that you can pump. Like, well, whatever. <laughs> Threat of Activation is okay, you know? It's, I don't know. Again, talking myself into, is this better than I thought it was at first glance now that I've actually really considered it? This is okay. I like one-drops that have more relevance later on in the game, and this has relevance late in the game two ways. If you played it early, it still has relevance in the late game because you can pump a bunch of mana into it. If you didn't play it early and you drew it late, still okay, you know, you pump four mana into it. Or seven mana, God forbid, just hit for five. Like, is this actually, is this actually pretty good, guys? I think this might actually be pretty good, seriously. But on to Bolsh Tide Turner as I calm down a little bit. This is two mana, one in the blue for a 1 3 Merfolk Wizard that taps for blue, but you can only spend that mana to cast an instant or sorcery or kicked spell. So we've seen dudes like this. They don't see a ton of play, usually. I doubt this one's any different, but still, I do like that blue rampers exist. We also saw Take Up the Shield, Toxic Abomination, and Tattered Apparition. Again, I think the middle card here is the best <laughs> Toxic Abomination. It's two mana, one in a blue, or one in a black. For a 3-2 Phyrexian Zombie, and when it ETBs, you lose two life. So, you know, 2 mana, 3-2. It's good in those Shadow of Mortality decks, I guess. <laughs> but I'm still not sure how much you're going to want to play this. But in your Zombie decks, it replaces white. So, if you needed to do that, here's your 2 mana, 3-2. It doesn't come into play tapped anymore. Also, it doesn't make extra dudes anymore. It's like the best thing about that card. So, I don't know. Maybe you'll play it if you're that hard up for zombies. But next up is Take Up the Shield. This is two mana, one and a white for an instant. That puts a plus one, plus one counter on a creature, and that creature gains lifelink and indestructible until end of turn. This could, you could make an argument, I think, for this in the, you know, white X, you know, tempo decks and standard, like the blue white deck that plays Illuminator Virtuoso and all those other dudes. But those decks have access to Slip Out the Back and Boon of Safety and like all manner of one mana protection spells. This could replace whatever it's called, the UC variant in blue that gives the creature hexproof. Is it UC a guard approach? That is not it. That can't be it. Maybe it is. But either way. Um Either way, it could replace that card, but the fact that it's two mana is actually more impactful than you might think that it would be. That's double the mana. You have to keep a lot of mana open at that point. It's harder to play creatures on some turns and still play this. It's harder to play your Homestead Courage once or twice and still play this. So it's actually pretty impactful that it's two mana, but those decks would often play like a one of Sigiri Shelter. I'm really giving myself a lot of editing work here, aren't I? <laughs> For this one this one kind of lame card, but still, those decks would play, on occasion, a couple of two mana cards that are rotating, and this replaces any of those that you might consider playing, and it also replaces things like Cradle of Safety that you might consider subbing in for some of those rotating cards. I think it's just better than a card like that. So I do kind of like this a good bit, but we'll move on to Tattered Apparition. This is the worst card on the page, so we'll do it last, right? Four mana, three and a black for a 2-2 two, two Flying Shade that you can pump two mana, a black and a colorless into, and have it gain plus one, plus one till end of turn. So all the way, by the way, you can pump a black and a generic into it comment section, but I'm just, I'm getting you today. I see you. I'm trying to stay a step ahead. 
<laughs> anyway, this is a uh, it's terrible. It's bad. It's like the, one of the most bolt cards we've seen in the set so far. I don't think that's too controversial of a statement. Now we saw a cycle of cards today that could actually be better than I think. <laughs> They're all cards that get that cost less to cast if you meet conditions like Talarian Terror. This is seven mana, six and a blue for a five five serpent, but it costs one less to cast for each instant sorcery in your graveyard and has ward two. So if you can get three instants or sorceries in your graveyard. Then suddenly this costs four mana for a 5-5 five, five ward 2, which is still probably not super good. <laughs> in standard, at least, you know. In some decks, if you can get five, <laughs> that's more than you think. If you can get five instants and sorceries in your yard, then yeah, it costs two. That's great. So I really want to try this card out, but I'm still not super confident in most of these. They all seem kind of tuned for limited play, right? But some of them are massively tempting, and this is one of them, but so is Molten Monstrosity. This too is eight mana, seven and a red for a five, five Hellion, and it costs X less to cast, but this time X is the greatest power among creatures you control. Also, Monstrosity has Trample. That's not bad. So if you have a four, four in play, this costs four to cast. Again, a four mana, five, five, if you have a four, four in play. If you have a five, five in play, it costs three to cast. That's pretty good. But, like, you need a 5-5. Five, five. And, like, what are the chances? Actually not super low, <laughs> depending on how you build your deck. So, you know, I don't... I I also don't hate this. I think that these are, like, perfectly balanced in terms of the casting cost. But some of them aren't as good <laughs> as others. But we'll look at Writhing Necromass next, which is my maybe my favorite of this whole cycle. This is 7 mana, 6 and a black for a 5-5 five, five zombie giant that has Death Touch and costs one less to cast, but this time it's for each creature card in your graveyard. It, we've already seen, I mean, what is this, a Gurmag Angler, basic? It's kind of a Gurmag Angler. Um, all of these are kind of a Gurmag Angler when you think about it, but this one feels more like one, maybe just because it's black, but still. You know, I feel like you could pretty easily make this like a two mana 5-5. Five, five. Even if it's a three mana 5-5, five, five, Death Touch, like, it's still probably worth it you gotta do a lot of work to get it there but you know with all the self mill and standard and these self mill decks that play almost nothing but creatures it's fairly easy to get you know five six creatures in your yard like relatively early this one costs less than the other one too for what it's worth and not only does it cost less but again i think this is an easier condition to fulfill than some of the others so i i do mm, i i'm trying to not like it but i can't help myself they're pretty good but we also saw stall for time and vine shaper prodigy again one of these cards i think is way better than the other but vine shaper prodigy these are both okay though vine shaper prodigy is a two mana two two elf druid with kicker one and a blue when it enters the battlefield if it was kicked look at the top three cards of your library put one into your hand the rest on the bottom in any order this is okay it really is just kind of okay, you know? It can be a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two if you need an early blocker or an early attacker, conversely. But still, you know, it can be just a bear, a grizzly bear, so that's okay. But later on, it can be a thing that gets you some pretty decent card selection. ETBs replaces itself, you know? So I don't hate this either. Back in the day, I think this would have been a standard playable. And by back in the day, I mean like 8 to 10 years ago. But nowadays, I'm not like too sure that this is very playable and standard. But it is very playable, I think, in the limited environment where I think it shines pretty brightly. But on to the next. Stall for Time does just that, although I'm not sure how playable the card actually is. This is 3 mana, 2 and a white for an instant with Kicker, 1 and a blue. Tap up to two target creatures. If the spell was kicked, you put a stun counter on each of those dudes, and then you draw a card. So for five mana at instant speed, this locks dudes down for two turns and draws a card. But even just for three mana, locking a couple of dudes out of attacking you for a turn, kind of a fog effect that draws a card, is actually probably better than it looks too. Although at the end of the day, very likely not worth a slot in your deck. But if your, you know, blue-white control deck cares a little bit about tempo more than it cares about, you know, just hardcore controlling the game until turn 200, decking my opponent, I have one win condition in my whole deck, I don't think this card goes in those decks. But in those, like, again, kind of more 
not strictly tempo oriented. I don't think this goes in like the Delver of Secrets, Illuminator Virtuoso deck. But again, in those control decks that are more of a hybrid and they have more win conditions in them, they care a little bit about tempo, right? I think this could actually be kind of a sleeper pick, but at the end of the day, there's very likely just better things you could play. Would you rather play this or Faithful Absence? You could play both, but you probably should just stick to the Faithful Absence, to be honest. But there's still something kind of intriguing about this card. Now, final card of the day here, but before we get out of here, we'll end up issuing a correction from yesterday's video. Gonna start doing that this season. Hopefully I don't have to do that this season, but that's probably unrealistic. So we are gonna start doing that. We got one more thing to talk about before we leave, but final card of the day is Najal the Storm Runner. This is just one of those uncommon legends. It doesn't look too great, but I still thought we'd end the day on a kind of hype uncommon for like Brawl or whatever. It still looks cool. Storm Runner is five mana, two, two blue and a red for a five, four legendary Efree wizard. Love the Efree. You may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. Whenever Najal the Storm Runner attacks, you may pay two. If you do, when you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy it. Choose new targets for the copy if you'd like. I want to really like this, because a little bit of dev lore for you, in case you didn't know this about me. Casting sorceries as though they had flash, or like casting them at instant speed, whatever, is actually one of my favorite like lines of text or things to do in like all of magic. I love casting sorceries as instants, bud. It's like one of my favorite things ever. And this card does that, but it costs five. It costs five mana, and that is way too much. You have to attack with it before you can really do too much. Really have to untap with it on the battlefield. Because you're probably not going to play it, and then also play a sorcery at instant speed that turn, unless you have six or seven mana. Which isn't unheard of, but, you know, when you have to have six or seven mana to make a card be super valuable the turn it comes into play... You're you're starting to you're starting to leave standard playability, especially when we have six and seven drops in standard already that do unbelievable stuff. So if you're paying seven mana for this, you have to compare it to like a titan of industry, right? When I say paying seven mana, I mean leaving two up when you cast it. But and in that case, titan of industry is better, you know. But still, casting things at sorcery speed is one of my favorite cheats in the game. And even at five mana, I'm going to try to make it work some way or another. And if this does get to attack, suddenly you get to cast a sorcery during your combat step or at the end of the turn, right? Um, and all of that is really quite good. You know, two mana is a lot. Two mana is a lot. But I imagine if you get to untap with this on the battlefield, you just go to combat immediately. You got all your mana untapped. So you should be able to use that two mana to great effect a lot of times. But still, shouldn't talk too much about this one. It is, it, I was going to say commander playable, it is brawl playable. Now before we get out of here, as promised, let's talk a bit about Archangel of Wrath from yesterday. I was really excited about this card, and I still am. Now I may have misspoken. Um, I think I said that you can blink this and then like re-kick it. You can't do that. You can't kick it, you can't blink a thing and then re-kick it, because kicking happens on cast, and I know that. We all know that. <laughs> I misspoke. What really would work with this is bouncing it which is the objectively wrong thing that I said. I believe I said blinking when I really should have said bouncing. Bounce this, probably okay. But don't blink it, because you can't kick things when you blink them. But the other thing I negated to mention, this was just an omission, is that when you do kick this card, it has lifelink, right? This is actually I think, the most popular comment on the video because I just didn't even think of this. I'm a big dum-dum, I guess, but still, this has lifelink. So when you shock a thing or when you get four damage off of it, you'll gain some life because it has lifelink. And that is actually very good. It makes the card even better than I thought. So I get to be even more excited <laughs> about a card that I already thought was pretty solid. Now that is all the cards from Friday. We got a little bit more draft stuff today. Yesterday was a really hype day, but we will get some things over the weekend. If you check the, uh, if you check Wizards website, uh, it says that we should expect previews both tomorrow and Sunday. Now, Saturday night, I'll be back tomorrow night with tomorrow's spoilers. And then Sunday night, I'll be on the Twitch streams. That's twitch.tv slash dev. Following is free over there. And if you have a Prime, an Amazon Prime subscription in your household, subscribing is free as well to one streamer a month, right? So make sure you check out the Twitch streams because on Sunday, I'll be there at 8 p.m. 
Eastern Standard Time to talk about whatever cards we get on Sunday and also my top five or ten favorite cards spoiled so far from the set. So we're going to have a lot of fun over there with the Strictly Squad. Come join us. Hang out. We do a lot of chill and we have a lot of fun. So check out those Twitch streams. That's how we're going to be doing spoiler content on Sunday. But then on Monday, one of the biggest days of the season so far, we'll be back on the couch for that. But that's it. So just let me know how you felt about all the cards from today. There were a few sleeper picks in those commons and uncommons. And even in the rares and mythics, there's some things that kind of look mediocre but could be better than they look. There was It was a day of cards like that. So let me know what your picks are from the day, what looks better or worse <laughs> than I kind of pegged it as, right? Although I really hedge my bets today a good bit. <laughs> can't say I hated any of the cards today. But I can't really say that I loved any of the cards today either. So just let me know how your feelings are forming down there in the comments section and do all the stuff. I've already told you about Twitch, but of course like and subscribe for more spoiler content. Hit the bell for the notifications and check out the Patreon if you want to support the channel. You like my steez, the cut of my jib, and you want to help out around here. It really does. Just a buck a month and you'll be able to vote on content once we get to, you know, deck season once we get to the season at large and dominaries a real set we can play with you'll be able to vote on what content we do and that's not a bad deal for a buck if i say so myself but aside from that i guess i'm done yammering so i will catch you cats later i'm dead from the place thanks for watching wizards spread love and be kind